My name is Elaine. I'm a 56-year-old doctor at our local hospital, a profession that has been both my calling and my refuge, especially since becoming a widow two decades ago. My life, outside of the hospital, revolves around my only son, Thomas, a 30-year-old who recently told me about his serious relationship with a girl named Clara. He described her in such glowing terms that I was both curious and eager to meet her. So, I invited them over for dinner. The day of their visit, I was a bundle of nerves. I wanted everything to be perfect. I prepared my signature dishes, a golden baked chicken, sweet milk pudding, and a hearty salad with chicken eggs, amongst others. I hoped these familiar comforts would make Clara feel welcome. When they arrived, Clara was noticeably thin and somewhat pale, but I brushed off my initial concern, attributing it to nerves or perhaps a dietary choice I wasn't yet aware of. I greeted them warmly. Welcome, Clara. It's so lovely to finally meet you, I said with a smile. Thank you, Mrs. Elaine, Clara replied politely, though her voice was barely above a whisper. We settled in the living room for a bit before moving to the dining room. I could sense Thomas's excitement as he introduced Clara to my home. However, the atmosphere shifted drastically once we sat down for dinner. Clara's eyes widened in shock when she saw the baked chicken on the table. Her face contorted into a look of disgust as she exclaimed, I can't believe you're serving this. I'm a hard vegetarian. I don't eat such things. Thomas turned beet red. Mom, I'm so sorry, I should have told you about Clara's diet, he stammered. Clara cut in sharply, Thomas, you're such a fool. How could you not mention something so important? I was taken aback by her harsh words. It was uncomfortable to see Thomas being scolded like that. Quickly trying to remedy the situation, I offered, Clara, I'm sorry about the misunderstanding. Perhaps you'd like to try some of the other dishes? Do they have any animal products? Eggs? Milk? Clara interrogated, her tone accusatory. Yes, they do, I replied, feeling a growing sense of unease. She slammed her hand on the table, pushing away the dishes. I can't even stand the sight of them. Clara stood up abruptly and stormed out of the house, leaving Thomas to mutter an apology before running after her. Several months after the disastrous dinner, Thomas and Clara's wedding day arrived. Despite my reservations about Clara, I put on a brave face for my son's sake. The wedding, as I'd been forewarned, was entirely vegetarian. I had never been to a wedding like this before, and neither had most of our family. As I walked into the venue, I couldn't help but feel out of place. The decorations were beautiful, but the atmosphere was unfamiliar. Clara's friends, also vegetarians, mingled amongst themselves, discussing the virtues of their dietary choices. My sister, Martha, leaned over to me and whispered, Elaine, have you seen the menu? I can't pronounce half of these dishes. I smiled wryly, just go with it, Martha, it's Thomas's day. The ceremony was lovely, but the reception was where things got interesting. The array of vegetarian dishes was certainly exotic. My relatives poked at their food with a mix of curiosity and apprehension. During the meal, my brother-in-law, George, a man never known for his tact, called a waiter over. Excuse me, son, is there any chance we could get a steak or something? Just a small one? The waiter, trying to remain polite, responded, I'm sorry, sir. The menu is strictly vegetarian as per the couple's request. George grunted, well, I guess it's salad for dinner then. Despite the unfamiliar food, I tried to focus on the positive. Thomas looked genuinely happy, albeit a bit thinner than I remembered. As the evening progressed, I observed Clara. She was the center of attention among her friends, laughing and seeming in her element. Yet, there was an edge to her laughter, a sharpness that made me uneasy. A few days after the wedding, Thomas came to visit me alone. His appearance startled me, he had lost more weight and looked tired. Thomas, are you all right? You've lost so much weight, I said, 
concern evident in my voice. He sighed, looking down at his hands. Mom, Clara's been, well, she's put me on a strict vegetarian diet too. Says it's non-negotiable. I was taken aback. But, Thomas, your job is physically demanding. You need a balanced diet. He shrugged, helplessly. I know, Mom, but I want to make her happy. It's just, it's been hard adjusting. I watched him leave later, feeling a mix of sadness and frustration. Clara's influence over him was more profound than I had feared. My son, once so vibrant and full of life, now seemed a shadow of his former self. After several sleepless nights, filled with worry about Thomas, I decided it was time to take action. I couldn't stand by and watch my son's health deteriorate. With a heavy heart, I picked up the phone to call Clara, Thomas's wife. I hoped that as a doctor, I could express my concerns in a way that would resonate with her. Hello, Clara. It's Elaine, Thomas's mother. I hope I'm not calling at a bad time. I began, my voice as warm and friendly as I could muster. What do you want, Elaine? Clara's voice was cold, distant. I'm calling about Thomas, I said cautiously. I've noticed he's lost quite a bit of weight and seems very tired lately. I'm worried it could be related to his new diet. Clara let out a sigh, audibly annoyed. Look, Elaine, Thomas is perfectly fine. He's just adapting to a healthier way of eating. You're overreacting. I understand your perspective, Clara, but as a doctor, I see signs of nutritional deficiencies in Thomas. He works a physically demanding job, and a strict vegetarian diet without proper planning can lead to health issues, I explained, trying to keep the conversation civil and factual. Elaine, I don't need a lecture on nutrition from you. We've done our research. Thomas is on a balanced vegetarian diet, and that's that. You're not a dietitian, Clara retorted sharply. But Clara, there are certain nutrients that are hard to get from a vegetarian diet alone, especially for someone with Thomas's lifestyle. Perhaps we could work together to find a diet that meets his nutritional needs and aligns with your dietary preferences? I suggested, hoping for a compromise. Clara's voice rose in frustration. I'm not interested in your help, Elaine. Thomas is my husband, and we make our decisions together. You need to respect that and stay out of it. Before I could respond, she hung up. I stared at the phone, feeling a mix of anger and helplessness. Clara's unwillingness to even consider my concerns was alarming. Later that day, my sister, Karen, came over. I shared the distressing phone call with her. Karen, I don't know what to do. Clara just shut me down. She wouldn't even listen to my concerns about Thomas. I shared, my hands trembling slightly. Karen, always a source of practical advice, looked thoughtful. Elaine, it's a tough situation. But maybe Thomas needs to come to this realization on his own. Clara obviously has a strong influence on him. I nodded, knowing she was right, yet feeling uneasy. I just can't sit back and watch Thomas suffer. He's always been a bit too accommodating, and now it's affecting his health. Karen reached across the table, squeezing my hand. I know, Elaine. But sometimes stepping back is the only way they learn. Maybe when Thomas sees the toll it's taking on him, he'll make a change. A few days after my futile conversation with Clara, Thomas came to visit me unexpectedly. It was a cold, gray afternoon, the kind that made you want to stay indoors. When I opened the door, the sight of him took my breath away. He looked nothing like the son I knew. His face was drawn and pale, his eyes lacking their usual spark. But it was the scratches on his face that alarmed me the most. Thomas, what happened to you? I exclaimed, ushering him inside. He avoided my gaze, a sign that he was uncomfortable. It's nothing, Mom, just a little argument with Clara. I led him to the living room, my mind racing with worry. Argument? Thomas, she scratched your face. This is serious. 
he finally looked at me, his eyes weary. I know, mom. I just, I don't know what to do anymore. I fetched my first aid kit and began treating his scratches gently. Tell me what happened, Thomas. You know you can talk to me. He sighed, a deep, troubled sigh. I went out for a quick bite. I just wanted to eat something more high-calorie and tasty, you know? I went to this cafe and ordered a burger. Clara saw me through the window. She stormed in and made a huge scene. I couldn't hide my shock. A scene? Over a burger? Thomas nodded, looking down at his hands. Yeah. She was screaming about me betraying our lifestyle, our values. She said I was poisoning myself. Then she scratched my face and told me to leave the house. I finished bandaging his face, feeling a mix of anger and helplessness. Thomas, this isn't healthy. You can't live like this. Being forced to change your diet and then being attacked for eating a burger? It's not right. He leaned back on the sofa, closing his eyes. I know, mom. But I love her. I thought I could make this work. I sat beside him, my heart aching for my son. Love shouldn't be this hard, Thomas. It shouldn't hurt like this. We sat in silence for a while, the only sound the ticking of the clock on the wall. Finally, Thomas spoke up. I think I'll stay here tonight, if that's okay. I just need some time to think. Of course, you can stay as long as you need, I replied, trying to offer him a comforting smile. That evening, as I cooked dinner, I kept glancing at Thomas, who was sitting at the kitchen table, lost in thought. I prepared a simple, hearty meal, roast chicken, mashed potatoes, and steamed vegetables. The kind of food I knew he loved. As we ate, I tried to lighten the mood. Remember when you were a kid, and you wouldn't eat anything but chicken nuggets for a week? Thomas managed a small smile. Yeah, I was a picky eater. But I always loved your cooking, Mom. I reached across the table, squeezing his hand. You're always welcome here, Thomas. You're my son, and I just want you to be happy and healthy. He squeezed back, a glimmer of the old Thomas in his eyes. Thanks, Mom. I really needed this. The next couple of weeks passed in a blur of worry and sleepless nights. Then, one ordinary Thursday, my world was rocked by a phone call that every parent dreads. It was the hospital. Mrs. Parker, your son Thomas was brought in this morning. He's been in an accident, the voice on the other end said, calm yet impersonal. My heart skipped a beat. Is he all right? What happened? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. He's stable now, but he lost consciousness at the wheel. He's lucky, the injuries aren't serious. You can come and see him, the caller replied. I hurried to the hospital, my mind racing with a thousand fears. When I arrived, I saw Thomas lying in a hospital bed, looking even more pale and thin than before. Thomas, oh my God, are you all right? I gasped, rushing to his side. He managed a weak smile. I'm okay, mom. Just a bit shaken up. A doctor I knew, Dr. Simmons, came into the room. Elaine, we've given him a thorough checkup. Physically, he's fine, just a few bruises. But his blood tests show signs of malnourishment. It seems he fainted due to low blood sugar. I turned to Thomas, my worry turning into anger. Malnourishment? Thomas, is this because of your diet? Thomas avoided my gaze, nodding slightly. I guess I haven't been eating properly. Clara's been so strict about the diet. I turned to Dr. Simmons. Can we make sure he gets a proper meal here? Something substantial? Of course, Elaine. We'll take care of him, Dr. Simmons assured me. I sat by Thomas's bed, holding his hand. Thomas, this has to stop. You could have been killed. All, because of this, this diet. Thomas sighed, a look of resignation on his face. I know, Mom. I just wanted to make Clara happy. 
but not at the cost of your health, Thomas. This isn't just about food, it's about control. She can't dictate what you eat to this extent, I said, my voice firm but filled with concern. He looked away, his eyes filling with tears. I love her, mom. I thought love was about compromises. Compromises, yes. But not like this. Not when it puts you in danger, I replied, squeezing his hand. We sat in silence for a while, the beeping of the heart monitor the only sound in the room. Thomas eventually drifted off to sleep, exhausted from the ordeal. I tried to call Clara, but she didn't answer the phone. Maybe she was afraid of my reaction to what had happened, or maybe she didn't care. After Thomas was discharged from the hospital, I insisted he stay with me for a while. Clara didn't mind. At least she didn't reply to my message. Thomas needed proper care, and I wanted to make sure he got back on his feet, both physically and emotionally. The first evening at my house, I prepared a hearty meal. As I set the table, I could see Thomas eyeing the food with a mix of hunger and hesitation. Mom, this looks amazing, but I don't know if I should. Clara might not like it, Thomas said, a troubled look crossing his face. Thomas, right now, you need to focus on your health. Clara isn't here, and you need to eat, I responded firmly, serving him a generous portion of roasted chicken and vegetables. He reluctantly began to eat, and with each bite, I saw a bit of color return to his cheeks. This is really good, Mom. I didn't realize how much I missed her cooking. I sat across from him, watching him eat. Thomas, you've always been healthy. It's painful to see you like this. Your relationship with Clara, it's not just about food. It's about control and your well-being. Thomas set his fork down, his expression pained. I know, Mom. I just don't know what to do. I love her, but everything is so complicated now. Love shouldn't make you compromise your health or who you are. You've always been considerate and caring, but you can't set yourself on fire to keep someone else warm," I said, hoping my words would resonate with him. Over the next few days, I took care of Thomas, ensuring he ate well and rested. We talked a lot, about everything and nothing. I avoided pressing him about Clara, hoping he would come to his own conclusions. One evening, as we were sitting in the living room, Thomas spoke up. Mom, I've been thinking a lot. Maybe I've been trying too hard to please Clara, losing myself in the process. I nodded. It's important to find a balance, Thomas. In a relationship, both people should feel valued and respected. He looked at me, a newfound determination in his eyes. I'm going to talk to Clara. I need to be honest about how I feel, about the diet, and everything else. I reached over, squeezing his hand. Whatever you decide, Thomas, I'm here for you. Just remember, your health and happiness are what's most important. As Thomas went to bed that night, I felt a mix of hope and apprehension. He was at a crossroads, and the next steps he took would shape his future. All I could do was support him and hope that he found the strength to make the right decisions for himself. The situation escalated quickly when Clara, Thomas's wife, burst into my house during lunch. Thomas was just starting to look a bit better after days of proper nutrition at my place. Thomas, what are you doing? Clara shrieked as she saw him eating the chicken broth I'd made. Thomas looked up, startled. Clara, I'm just... You're betraying our lifestyle again. I can't believe this. Clara was livid, her eyes blazing with anger. Before I could intervene, she knocked the bowl of broth from Thomas's hands, sending it crashing to the floor. I stood up, my own anger rising at her irrational behavior. Clara, that's enough. You're in my house, and I won't tolerate this behavior. I said firmly. You're poisoning him, Elaine with your meat and your old-fashioned ideas. Clara shouted, turning her wrath towards me. Thomas tried to calm her down. Clara, please, let's just talk about this. Ignoring him, Clara pulled out her phone. I'm calling the police. 
I won't let you harm him any further. Thomas and I exchanged a look of disbelief as Clara dialed. Within minutes, a police car pulled up outside, and two officers came to the door. What seems to be the problem here? One of the officers asked, looking between Clara, Thomas, and me. Clara immediately began, pointing a finger at me. She's been forcing my husband to eat meat. She's trying to poison him against his will. The officer turned to me, his expression one of mild confusion and concern. Ma'am, is this true? I shook my head. No, officer. I'm Thomas's mother, and I've been taking care of him. He's been unwell due to malnutrition. I'm a doctor, and I was just trying to help him recover. Thomas spoke up, his voice weak but steady. It's true, officers. I've been staying with my mom for a few days to get my health back. I went to my kitchen counter and picked up a hospital report. Here's the report from when Thomas was admitted after fainting due to low blood sugar. His diet was insufficient, and that's what I've been trying to address. The officers took the report, glancing over it. Clara's face turned pale as the reality of the situation started to dawn on her. Ma'am, it looks like Mrs. Parker has been acting in her son's best interest, the officer said to Clara. If there's no actual harm or criminal activity here, we can't take any action. Clara was speechless, her earlier fury deflated. The officers advised her to resolve the matter peacefully and left. Thomas looked exhausted by the whole ordeal. Clara, I think you should go. We need to talk, but not now. Not like this. Clara, still in shock, quietly left the house without another word. I watched her go, feeling a mix of relief and sadness. The whole situation had spiraled out of control, and I worried about what this meant for Thomas's future with Clara. In the weeks that followed the police intervention, Thomas stayed with me, slowly regaining his strength and clarity of mind. We had many long conversations about his marriage and future. One evening, as we sat in the living room, a sense of resolve seemed to settle over him. Mom, I've made a decision, Thomas said, his voice more assertive than I'd heard in a long time. I looked at him, feeling a mix of apprehension and relief. What have you decided, Thomas? I can't go on like this with Clara. Our marriage, it's not healthy. I'm going to file for a divorce, he declared, though I could see the pain in his eyes. I reached out, taking his hand. I know this must be hard for you, but I think you're making the right choice. You deserve to be happy and healthy, Thomas. He nodded, a sad smile on his lips. I know. I just wish it didn't have to come to this. The next few days were a whirlwind as Thomas set the divorce process in motion. It was a tough time, but he handled it with a strength that made me proud. When the day came for him to move back into his own place, I helped him pack his things. As he was about to leave, he turned to me. Mom, I can't thank you enough. You've been my rock through all of this. I hugged him tightly. You're my son. I'll always be here for you, no matter what. A couple of weeks after Thomas moved out, I received a call from him. He sounded different, more like his old self. Mom, I wanted to tell you that the divorce has been finalized. And, I decided to take legal action against Clara for her role in the accident. I was surprised. That's a big step, Thomas. Are you sure about this? Yes, I am. It's not just about me. It's about setting things right. And, you know, the court ruled in my favor. Clara has to pay me compensation, he explained. I could hear the confidence in his voice. I'm proud of you, Thomas. You're standing up for yourself. There was a pause before he spoke again. I've also started seeing a counselor. I think it's helping me understand a lot about myself and my relationships. Hearing this brought a sense of peace to my heart. That's wonderful, Thomas. Taking care of your mental health is just as important. As we ended the call, I felt a wave of emotions. 
The past months had been a roller coaster, but through it all, Thomas had found his way back to himself. He had faced his challenges head-on and emerged stronger. The future was uncertain, but I knew that whatever it held, Thomas was now better equipped to face it. And as for me, I would continue to be there for him, his steadfast support, as I had always been.